Hello, in this video we'll continue our introduction to predicate logic with a discussion of its semantics. It's usual to make a distinction between the syntax and the semantics of logical systems. Syntax has to do with the structure or organization of sentences, the way in which these are put together from their parts, and what counts as a well-formed sentence. Semantics, on the other hand, has to do with how those sentences are interpreted, or with the meaning that is assigned to them. In our previous lesson, we discussed the syntax of PL, and although we mentioned meanings here and there so as to anchor our discussion, our focus was on the possible configurations of the tokens in our system, on how those uppercase and lowercase letters, those upside down and backwards characters, could be placed next to each other, pretty much regardless of their meanings. In fact, if we had stopped there, we could have pretended that we were discussing some sort of game, like chess, or like tic-tac-toe, instead of a system of symbols used to express meanings. In this video, we'll start to develop the tools to provide our naked formal system with interpretations. We'll start to see how PL could be used to say things about the world, or perhaps I should say about certain models of it. So let's start our preview of PL semantics with a discussion of the central notion of an interpretation. As I mentioned earlier, we don't want a merely formal system a series of strings that don't say anything about the world. We want to forge a relation between the symbols in the system, ultimately sentences, and some domain of objects and properties. This relation is expressed in terms of truth, so we want a method to determine which of our sentences are true, given certain conditions. To do this, we must provide interpretations for our logical system. In sentential logic, our interpretations took the form of assignments of truth values to atomic sentences. So, if our basic atomic sentences were A through D, we would provide an interpretation to all the sentences formed from them simply by saying which of those sentence letters are true and which are false. Critical logic interpretations, however, are a bit more involved. Here we have to go below the sentence level to assign values to the building blocks of sentences, predicates, terms, and quantifiers. The first ingredient in a PL interpretation is a domain of individual objects. These are the things that will be designated by our names, that will satisfy, or not, our predicates. They are also the things over which our quantifiers will range. So, for instance, our domain could be the set, comprised of six figures. The next component of our interpretation is a collection of terms, though in these initial stages we'll focus on names, as opposed to variables. Terms are normally associated with individuals. In the simplest case, they are simply names for the things in the domain. For instance, we can give the name A to the little square, and the Pac-Man thingy can be called B, so forth. Notice that this naming relation is a function. So, although it's possible to have one object with two names, as in the case of Pac-Man here, which goes by the monikers of B and D, names that designate more than one object are disallowed. In this example, the offending term is E, of course. Finally, naming in PL is an onto function, because every object in the domain must have a name. The domain has to do with the interpretation of names, and the next component of our interpretation is the predicate. As we know from our discussion of syntax, we have different groups of predicates, depending on the number of places they assign, which is also called their adicity. Let's start with one-place predicates. To interpret these, we simply have to indicate which individuals satisfy them. For instance, suppose you have the predicate fx, where the f here is supposed to put you in the mind of things with four sides. Then you interpret it by listing the things that fx applies to. You'll often hear us say that one place predicate is associated with a set of individuals, namely the set of things to which it applies. To interpret two place predicates, you don't link them with individuals, but with pairs of them. That is, you indicate which pairs of individuals satisfy the predicate in question. So, suppose that you also have the relation AXY. Think of it as the relation of being directly above something else. Then, these are the two pairs that satisfy it. So, just as predicates are linked with sets of individuals, two place relations are interpreted by linking them to sets of pairs of individuals. In this case, it is the set of all pairs of things such that one thing is above the other. Sounds like something from Monty Python. Know that the members of this set are the pairs, not the individual things. 
So this set has two members, not four. And this pattern generalizes over. If you have a relation with n places, you must say which n tuples of individuals satisfy your relation. So if your predicate has three places, you must indicate all the triples of which the relation is true, and so forth. Accordingly, this is often expressed by saying that you associate n place predicates with set of n tuples of individuals. Finally, by using the respective interpretations of our building blocks, together with the truth functional connectives, we can determine the values of all our PL sentences. Here's an example. Suppose that in the fragment of PL we are discussing, we have these five names. These are the PL nicknames of Bart, Lisa, Marge, Maggie, and Homer, respectively, who are all members of this wholesome family, Simpsons. Our predicates are these. Imagine that this predicate stands for these English expressions. IX, X is a Simpson. FX, X is female. WX, X works at a nuclear plant. SXY, X and Y are siblings. Our domain, then, is comprised of these five individuals. So, the first part of our interpretation is to assign individuals to names. In this way. However, outside of this cute example, it is hard, and certainly pointless, to make drawings of all the things in our domain and then trace arrows leading to names. So we take our names as proxies for the objects they designate, and simply declare our domain by listing the names of all the objects that are in it. The reason I included all the images is to remind you that this domain is supposed to be composed of things, not names. Okay, now let's include the predicates. Let's begin with IX, which as we said stands for X is a Simpson. The predicate is satisfied by all the individuals in the domain. However, again, instead of drawing things, we indicate which individuals satisfy the predicate by listing all the possible combinations of the available predicate name combinations, and then stipulating which of the resulting atomic sentences are true. So we proceed like this. For each of the members in our domain, we ask, does it satisfy I? So does B satisfy I, which is to say, is Bart a Simpson? The answer is yes. So the value for the atomic sentence IB is true. Then we ask the same for Lisa, which is also a Simpson. Therefore, IL is true. And so on for all the members of the domain. Okay, now to FX, to be understood as X is female. The predicate is satisfied by this three-membered set, price of Lisa, Marge, and Maggie, by no one else. So FL, FM, and FG get T's, while FB and FH get T's. WX. The only one who works at a nuclear plant is Homer, so we make WH true and the rest false. SXY is our version of X and Y are siblings. This is a two-place relation, so it applies to pairs of individuals. This predicate is satisfied by the pair comprised of Bart and Lisa, by the Bart-Maggie pair, and by the pair made of Lisa and Maggie. Now, let's express this in the forms of truth value assignments to atomic sentences. But first, if we want to list all the pairs formed out of five individuals, we need to multiply five times itself, which is 25. So let's go in groups of five. Let's start with those involving Bart. Bart is only the sibling of Lisa and Maggie. He's certainly not his own sibling or his parent's sibling, so we put a T under SBL and another one under SBG. And the rest get Fs. For the five corresponding to Lisa, we play T's under SLB and SLG, since her siblings are Bart and Maggie, and F's everywhere else. Marge, the mom, isn't anyone's sibling in this group. Maggie is the sibling of Bart and Lisa. And Homer, the dad, doesn't have any siblings here either, so it's all F's. Ultimately, you could get around all this work by writing T's under these three sentences, and say that all the other 22 are false. So in sum, our interpretation, which we'll call G, is completely described by stating these two components. First is the domain. And the second is all the values for all the atomic sentences formed by combining our predicates and our names. This one is for the predicate IX. This one is for the predicate FX, WX, 
and this one is for the relation SXY. Incidentally, you'll sometimes see some people that instead of displaying the values for sentences in a tabular form, simply list the sentences that are true. So that instead of putting an F below FB or FH, for instance, they simply write not FB or not FH. This is okay with me too. Just find this presentation tidier. Okay, I could ask you to find the truth values of certain sentences based on this interpretation. For instance, take the sentence FH and WH. In English, this would be Homer is female and Homer works at a nuclear plant. Or more idiomatically, Homer is a woman who works at a nuclear plant. These are the two conjuncts. And since the left conjunct is false, the whole sentence is false. On the other hand, if we have the same sentence but a V instead of an ampersand, we have a true sentence, since the right disjunct is true. What about this, every X is F? Since every member of our domain is human, we could say that this symbolizes everyone is female, as opposed to everything is female. I haven't given you any formal procedure for interpreting quantified sentences, but intuitively this sentence is false, since as we can see, two of the domain members are not female. So we give it an F. And what about this sentence? There is an X such that X is not W. In English, this could be somebody doesn't work at a nuclear plant, or at least one person is not a nuclear plant worker, or something along those lines. Again, intuitively this is true, given that nobody in this group except Homer works at a nuclear plant. Okay, we'll stop here. I hope this has given you a sense of how interpretations in predicate logic work. In our next video, we'll discuss this same topic but in a more disciplined way.